Do I have to forgive to be forgiven? So a lot of people worry about this, especially because there is a particular passage which we will look at where the answer seems to be quite a straightforward yes. But then that raises the question of whether it's putting works into the gospel. Obviously, I'm not the first person to explain this passage. Other people have set out to explain it before. So I'm not really going to offer you anything remarkably new or profound in this video that you probably don't already know, most of you at least. But a few people have asked me about this topic recently, so I thought it would just be good to do a resource for this on my channel. Then I'd have somewhat, something to point people towards if they have any questions about it. And not everybody is necessarily going to agree with what I say in this video either. So this question comes from Matthew 6, 14 to 15, where Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And so there it is. Because we need our sins to be forgiven to enter into eternal life, this verse is used to suggest that a saved person could lose or forfeit their salvation, or maybe actually that person wasn't saved to begin with, depending on which type of person we ask. Because presumably, such a person is not meeting the conditions to have their sins forgiven. So typically, more often than not, it's the loss of salvation crowd that would use these verses in such a way. I've also had some Roman Catholic parrots on my channel use these verses to justify work salvation, that we have to do good works to enter into heaven. Although I'm not quite sure why they would pick that verse, because I can't really imagine how much quantifiable work that we can visibly see on the outside it actually takes to forgive somebody. But there you go. Some people have explained this passage to be non-salvific forgiveness, for which legalists will reject as being an unsubstantiated claim. But of course they do get awfully confused. The idea of forgiveness not being about eternal life does confuse them. Some free graces say that it's about chastisement and loss of reward. We will need to consider how well substantiated this is. Another explanation used is that Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is intended to show us that we fail the standard of the law, so you couldn't possibly meet the requirement of this commandment. Well, Jesus does definitely do this in the Sermon, but that doesn't automatically mean that this is the purpose of the entire Sermon, or that such is the specific context of these verses, because the Sermon is very multifaceted. Before we decide on whether this verse establishes or disproves work salvation, first we need to understand that it can be proven from the Bible that forgiveness is not always about salvation onto eternal life. So for example, when we read Luke 23, 34, Jesus was being crucified and he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, I don't think anybody would read this and say that they all got saved and entered a state of grace, at least for the next five minutes until they unrepentantly sinned again and lost their salvation. Obviously, that's ridiculous. And thus far, anyway, I've never heard anybody use that verse to argue that his crucifier suddenly got saved because Christ prayed over them to forgive them there and then. That example of forgiveness is quite specific. Jesus is praying for them in regards to that one specific sin. That doesn't address all of their other sins. So how that would play out is that maybe at the judgment, God will perhaps go easy on them for that one specific issue. We can't really know, but he's not going to let them off the hook for all the sins that they've ever committed. Also, when you read about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit in Matthew 21, we see how Jesus declares no forgiveness in neither this world nor the world to come. So although the outcome of blaspheming the Spirit is the same in this world and the next, there is still a distinction made there nonetheless, unless you think that Jesus was just being hyperbolic. But we might infer that we can distinguish a difference between forgiveness in this world and forgiveness in the world to come. So it raises the question then, how do we know if forgiveness applies in this life or the next life? How are we meant to tell? If you search for every instance of where forgiveness or remission, because it's the same Greek word, is used, it might not be made very obvious. Bear in mind that forgiveness can vary in precise meaning. For example, these are all valid definitions of forgiveness. To give up resentment against or stop wanting to punish someone for an offence or fault or to pardon them or to relent in being angry or in wishing to exact punishment for an offence or fault. But it can also mean to absolve from payment of or a debt, for example. So we will have to digress from the video a little bit to answer this thoroughly, because it's important that we do understand this first. So let's consider the first two definitions of stop wanting to punish someone for an offence, to, to pardon their offence. 
So I'm going to briefly refer to Acts chapter 2, but I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because I've already covered it much more extensively in my Repentance in a Nutshell video. So check out video 18 in that series if you need a deeper study on Acts chapter 2. So in Acts 2, between verses 19 to 21, Peter describes the culmination of the last days. After saying that God will pour out his spirit and his servant shall prophesy, he goes on to describe what we suppose is the judgment day, that the great day of the Lord, which Jesus warned Peter about, the sun and the moon being darkened, blood and fire, and all these signs leading to the day of the Lord. And Peter goes on to say, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The crowd then go on to ask Peter, what shall we do? And Peter replies, repent and be baptised. And this is for the remission of sins or the forgiveness of sins. Now, I've explained in the repentance study that this has got nothing to do with turning from a sinful lifestyle. That wasn't the context of the discussion in that chapter. You may have heard this rubbish that repentance is a daily lifestyle change of the Christian or something like that. But Peter employs the verb as a one-time action. Repent. That's it. And then following repent, be baptised. And later in the chapter, people got baptised, implying that they repented. Now, don't miss this because it's important. Baptism in Acts 2 immediately follows repentance. In other scriptures, baptism follows belief. For example, Mark 16, 16, Acts 8, 12 to 13, and Acts 8, 36 to 38. So therefore, we can twin repentance with belief as a one-time action only. And this is the beginning of the Christian life, not the end of it. According to Acts 2, then, this baptism is for the representation of, or the purpose of, the remission of sins. Remission is translated from the same Greek word as forgiveness. So I've spoken about this before on my channel occasionally, that the King James Bible often uses the word remission, whereas other translations will use the word forgiveness, even though there's only one Greek word. Both remission and forgiveness in our King James Bible come from the exact same Greek word. So then you might wonder, well, why exactly did they translate it in two different ways in our English Bible? Well, it seems as if the King James uses the word remission when the context of forgiveness or the items that are being placed alongside forgiveness, in this case repentance and baptism, are one-time actions, done once, never to be done again. Whereas the King James will use the word forgive when it refers to a very specific action being forgiven rather than a more generalised forgiveness, or where forgiveness is just part of a list of items among other things, or where forgiveness could be for multiple or repetitive ongoing actions like, for example, when your brother trespasses against you several times in a single day. So as Acts 2 describes, this one-time act of repentance and the one-time act of baptism thus declared a one-time act of forgiveness, which would save the audience from the judgment on the day of the Lord. There was no indication that anything happening after this event would change the outcome of their forgiveness, or that there were any further conditions following this event. It was a one-time act leading to the one instance of the remission of sins. In Hebrews 10, we read about Jesus' sacrifice in relation to the forgiveness of our sins. And it's maybe not strictly talking about eternal life per se or hellfire in its immediate context, but you do see this theme again, this one time, once and for all, finality of forgiveness that happened in one event. And again, our King James Bible translates it as remission. And there are plenty of other scriptures we could turn to and arguments we could reach provided by those scriptures that tie in your salvation and conversion and the forgiveness of all of your sins with a one-time event. Passed from death onto life. Believe or repent. They're, they're synonymous. It's settled. It's done. And we would associate that with eternal forgiveness. Now, let's consider forgiveness where you could fluctuate between a state of being forgiven and not being forgiven according to your behaviour or your works. But let's also understand the consequences of forgiveness. And we could apply this to our third definition from the dictionary to absolve from a debt. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So this verse teaches us a few things. The verse is directed at God's own people. It is not directed towards unsaved people or those otherwise to whom the gospel is being preached. So this is more really applicable to you and I as Christians. This is quite consistent with the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6 that this whole video is based on because if you're a sharp student of the Bible, you might notice that in this sermon, Jesus often says, your father. Whereas when he gives the message of eternal life to many people in John's gospel who need to get saved, 
He's telling them to believe, and he often says, my father, or the father. We might infer from this language, then, that the Sermon on the Mount is more targeted towards God's people, much like Second Chronicles 7.14. Though Chronicles is a little bit different here in that it's not about men forgiving he- each other, strictly speaking. It's about their sins and deeds, although that may well include how they treat each other. We also see the outcome of their sins being forgiven, that God will heal their land. In this passage, God is replying to Solomon's prayer in the previous chapter, and in Solomon's prayer, he prayed both ways. So, for example, in chapter 6, verses 22 to 23, Solomon prays that if a man sin, God will judge him, yet also justifying the righteous. Now, pay attention to this. Solomon describes justifying the righteous as giving him according to his righteousness. Now, as I've spoken about this before in the Repentance series when dealing with Ezekiel, when you do good works or when you turn from your wickedness, the Old Testament describes this as your righteousness. But when we get to the New Testament, talking about salvation and so on, we have clear instructions from Paul warning us against establishing our own righteousness. So understand the application here. Your own righteousness here cannot get you eternal life. Next, Solomon prays that if the children of Israel have sinned and are essentially taken out of their land, if they then return and confess and so forth, God will bring them back to the land. And in the upcoming verses, we see this pattern repeated. If there be no rain because of sin, turn from sin and the rains come back. And this same theme repeats itself multiple times throughout the prayer, but with varying forms of punishments and forgivenesses. And God's reply in chapter 7 carries on this same theme. If my people do evil, then this will happen. And if they turn and I forgive them, then that will happen. And you get the impression here that this could go back and forth between the different generations or as time progresses. And this could go back and forth multiple times as the people sin, and then they turn from sin, and then they sin again, and so forth. All of the punishments described in this passage are earthly punishments, aka no rain, removed from the promised land, enemies come in and attack, pestilence, etc. Likewise, all of the forgivenesses are earthly forgivenesses too. The rain comes back, they are returned to the land, etc. Eternal life is not mentioned as being the context of forgiveness. And this is something that legalists either overlook or they just don't care. Now, there are a few discrepancies to be aware of. Obviously, Chronicles is more dealing with an entire people rather than specific individuals. But the crucial point here is that we see forgiveness applied in two different ways. Repentance onto salvation is a one-time effect for the forgiveness of sins. You do it once, it's finished, it's done. And Jesus' sacrifice was the one final sacrifice and it's over and it's done and there's no more revisiting it. Turning from sin and doing good for the forgiveness of sins, well, that is good, and God can bless that and reward that, but he also punishes when not doing that, in earthly ways at least, but that's your righteousness. And again, as I said, Paul warned about those trying to establish their own righteousness, because the righteousness that leads to eternal salvation must be imputed righteousness, not your own righteousness. Because your righteousness, as proven by the Chronicles account, could easily fail, as it did many, many times for the Old Testament Israelites. This is why, as believers in grace, we are very, very careful to divide the word of God in this matter. The legalists mix these things up in the same way that they mix up grace and works. The question is then, what sort of forgiveness is Jesus talking about in the Sermon on the Mount? What are the consequences of not being forgiven in its context? When Jesus said, forgive and be forgiven, or not, in the Sermon, To the unlearned eye, it can seem as if he doesn't give a lot of context to it because it immediately follows the Lord's Prayer. So it almost seems as if he just kind of jumped from one topic to another in this conversation. It's just a completely different topic now. But if we look at the Lord's Prayer, the latter half of the prayer does actually tie in with what Jesus is saying here. The latter half says, Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
So there are a few interesting things worthy of note here. Firstly, this is an example of a daily prayer. After all, praying for daily bread implies that the needs of the things in this prayer list are daily. Although that's not ironclad proof that it was intended in this way, but that's a way you could interpret it. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should just parrot and repeat this exact prayer every day. Jesus also taught a similar prayer to his disciples when they asked how to pray. So we can cross-reference this and assume that even here, Jesus is teaching us how to pray, not what to pray. But nevertheless, he indicates the type of things that we should be praying for. Secondly, the prayer itself includes asking for and giving forgiveness. So just as Jesus is teaching that we must forgive others to also be forgiven, the prayer also assumes that we are asking God to forgive us and likewise declaring as we also forgive others. Thirdly, the prayer asks to deliver us from evil and keep us from temptation. Now, evil in the King James Bible doesn't always mean doing evil or sinful deeds. It can also mean that unfortunate, disastrous things may come upon you, just as we saw in 2 Chronicles 6 and 7. Turn from sins that God may turn from the evil that befalls his people. We are likewise praying that we will also keep from temptation, which we might assume probably means sins, and to deliver us from evil that may befall us. So in summary, consider this. This prayer is, arguably, targeted at believers rather than unbelievers. This was a crowd that came to hear him. The gospel was already given earlier in chapter 5 and he keeps saying your father rather than the father or my father. Just as in 2 Chronicles 6 and 7 we saw the consequences of no forgiveness were evil coming on the land of Israel and the flip side to praying and turning from evil such that God would forgive would be the relenting of these calamities. Likewise, in the Lord's Prayer, we are praying to not to be led into temptation, which may well include turning from wickedness, and also praying that we be delivered from evil, which could be any number of calamities, including those described in Chronicles. So putting all of this biblical knowledge together, we might assume that forgiving others has nothing to do with forgiveness unto eternal salvation, because that was a one-time event that occurred at repentance or in other words, believing the gospel. And it was Christ's one-time sacrifice that dealt with the eternal application of forgiveness. But on the earth, this kind of forgiveness is not really fully manifest yet. We haven't been delivered from our sinful mortal flesh yet. It remains to be seen what we shall be, as First John tells us. This is a promise that we are waiting for glorification, but it hasn't happened yet. And because of all that, we are still in the process of resisting all the lusts of this world and also subject to some of the calamities that may befall this world. Logically, then, we can conclude that forgiving others, if we want to be forgiven, would depend on whether we want God to answer our prayer to be delivered from evil and to lead us not into temptation. Now, this is hard for us to relate to in our comfortable 21st century world, depending on where you're from, I suppose. But for many people, even today, the economy of their country may be really struggling or their country is at war, such as Ukraine, for instance. And this could very well happen to you and your country in your lifetime, where evil is coming upon the nation and you want God to deliver you from that evil. Sometimes believers in grace may bring out the chastisement argument that if you don't forgive, God will beat you with a whip or something like that. And other believers in grace do have a problem with chastisement in that way. So there is a danger that people can become immensely fearful of every tiny micro mistake they might make because they're absolutely terrified that God's going to send the rod down on them. But the problem is worrying about that doesn't really solve the root of the problem. So for the sake of those who disagree with that, or let's just say that you're worried about chastisement. Let, let's just take intentional chastisement out of the equation here. This idea that God is intentionally going to send uh, a beating stick down on you, okay, or causing calamity on you deliberately. Let's just remove that from the equation. Because really, I don't really see any evidence in the Sermon on the Mount here that Jesus is even talking about that or hinting about that. When you pray this example prayer, you're asking God to do something for you, deliver you from evil, lead you not into temptation, give your daily bread. So rather than thinking that God will send the whipping post down on you, just think of it on the flip side that God doesn't have to answer your prayer if he really doesn't want to. So maybe for you, being unforgiven is not about being beaten with a rod if you don't, but it's because you want God to reward you and give you your daily bread and lead you not into temptation and deliver you from evil. You want him to answer the things that you're praying about. But let's have a balanced approach here before people start to, again, fret and worry too much about this. Because consider that this is also the same sermon that tells us not to worry. And it also tells us that your Heavenly Father knows how to give good even though you are 
evil. Why is that? Because God is very, very forgiving. And so being in his image, being his children, we ought also to be forgiving as well. When you harbour unforgiveness, you may very well be actually hurting yourself more than you actually hurt other people. And at the end of the day, when you lift your eyes in eternity, it won't matter who wronged you anyway. Ten seconds in heaven, you won't care who hurt you anymore. So why should you care so much now? Let's further solidify the idea that this is not an eternal life proof text from the words of the prayer itself and the context earlier in the dialogue. In verses 14 to 15, Jesus uses the word trespassers, which we often think of as sins, and it is in many ways synonymous, but there is a slight difference in that trespass doesn't necessarily mean something that is against the law per se, but something that is against another person, which may not even be deliberate nor according to a moral framework, but against that person's personal wishes, like if I trespassed on your lawn without realising, for instance. If you went to Christian school where you occasionally spoke out the Lord's Prayer, or if you have said the Lord's Prayer corporately in a church setting, particularly where churches regularly read from a service sheet, you may have memorised the Lord's Prayer as something like this, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, or forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But interestingly, this is not quite how the Lord's Prayer is actually phrased in our Bible. In Matthew's Gospel, it actually uses the word debt or debtors on both sides of the equation. In Luke's parallel example prayer, we do have sins on one side of the equation, but we still have debt on the other side of the equation. This means that when we sin or trespass or when somebody trespasses against us, there is a debt associated with this. The ramifications of not being forgiven then is that the trespasser now has a debt that needs to be paid. Here's the problem when legalists make your forgiveness of others a condition for salvation. Romans 4 lays out the requirements of righteousness. By grace, justified by faith without works. And he explains why it is without works. Because if the reward, which in context is righteousness or glory, is worked for, then it is not a reward according to grace, i.e. an undeserved gift, but of debt. However, righteousness is reckoned by grace, not debt. Furthermore, those who are blessed are the ones whose iniquities are forgiven, not being forgiven or may be forgiven, are forgiven and not by debt. Therefore, you can't really take a passage that's dealing with debt and apply that to righteousness, which leads on to salvation, because debt is works. Therefore, forgiving others so that you can be rewarded with righteousness is works because you're trying to maintain a debt or clear a debt. Righteousness is reckoned by grace and your iniquities or your sins, they are forgiven. They are covered. Why are they forgiven without repaying debt? Because forgiveness unto salvation is a one-time event and it's by grace. It happened at the moment of conversion. You repented, in other words, you believe the gospel and your sins are forgiven for eternity, which is reckoned by grace. And earlier in the chapter, Jesus speaks about doing your alms, which is giving to the poor, in secret, because those who love to glory in their alms already have their reward before men, but you may be rewarded openly for the things that you do in secret. Now, the context here doesn't suggest that this has anything to do with heavenly reward. The context seems to be an earthly reward only. So this just further solidifies the concept that forgiving others is not about getting into heaven or even earning rewards in heaven. But if rewards in this life are given for giving alms, that means that rewards on this earth involve work. They won't necessarily be given for free. We need God to forgive our sins, also in an earthly way as well as a heavenly salvific way, because even with this reward and debt context here, I think a lot of us would still have a hard time trying to repay all of our debts to God in this way. There's still sins that we can't necessarily account for, and we may sometimes not even realise necessarily that we harbour unforgiveness. Because when we sin against other people, or when we have feelings towards other people, it's very subjective. So one person being bitter, he may not perceive it as unforgiveness in his own mind if he thinks he was right. Even being forgiven in an earthly manner that has nothing to do with salvation still requires some degree of grace because we're still unable to repay our debts. Therefore, God has to forgive them freely. For that same reason, we should also forgive other people freely because if we start charging those people for their debts, we might also expect God to start charging us for some of our debts and that's a big problem. 
But for righteousness unto salvation, we cannot repay our debt. And so anything that involves mixing with the working of debt or debt with salvation, these things should not be conflated by any means. And of course, how can we possibly discuss this topic without mentioning the parable of the unforgiving servants in Matthew chapter 18? For the sake of time and not repeating the same points, I won't expound on the entire parable, but we'll just consider the ending of the parable. At the end of the parable, when the Lord rebukes the unforgiving servant, he is delivered to the tormentors. Now, we normally associate this word with hell. However, the context here is actually prison, as you'll see from earlier in the parable. And prison in ancient times was often not for moral crimes, actually, but rather for debtors. So it was known as debtors prison. So the idea was not to go into prison forever, but to pay your debt in prison. And it's keeping you there to make you pay your debt, essentially. And the terms and conditions here is that when he shall be delivered unto the tormentors, this is until he shall pay all that was due. Now, there are parables where the wicked servant is cast into what seems like it would be hell, like the parable of talents, for instance, but not in this parable. Instead, the tormenting or the prison only lasts until the debt is paid, but this assumes that the debt can be paid. When it comes to eternity and salvation, the Bible seems to be clear that hell is a place of eternity. You cannot repay your debt there. This parable and the concept of forgiving each other then cannot really be applied to hell. Otherwise, it would apply that you can eventually pay your debt and then get out. And as a side note, the parable ends saying that forgiveness here is applied to your brother, particularly your brother in Christ, who is also forgiven eternally by grace. So it's not necessarily applicable to the unsaved world. Despite everything that I have pointed out from the Bible, some of you, understandably so, still worry about this passage, being afraid of the salvific connotations of it. What if the legalists have a point? After all, if our debts are freely forgiven, having God's imputed righteousness, and we are also to forgive others. Doesn't this suggest then that not forgiving others' debts implies that God won't forgive ours and we have to work our debt and therefore come full circle to being unsaved by grace because we have not had that same grace to others? I guess this question might be relevant if you're arguing that forgiveness isn't actually a work per se because you could maybe argue that if I forgive someone or I just let them off the hook for whatever they've done to me, I haven't necessarily worked for it or done a work. It's just kind of like a change of mind or repentance or faith, perhaps. So that's where the legalists might try and trap you with that. I do take the point on board. We, we do have to be careful that we don't just explain passages away where there might be something to the argument. I would still say that if you take a literal understanding of debt as prison or a person having a debt towards another person that's not a sin issue like a financial debt then really you forgive someone's financial debt so then technically you have worked for forgiveness because you had to work to get the paycheck. You've then lended somebody your paycheck. They didn't return it to you. So in that application of forgiveness, you did actually work for it. On the other hand, someone could try and maybe say that, well, if somebody just says something against you, they might have hurt your feelings. But then when you forgive them and get over it, that's not really a work because you didn't have to work to give them something or get something back in return. And your feelings don't really have any financial value. But that's quite subjective. Obviously, if we tried to wrestle all of that and do all of these what if this and what if that, it would just send us in a confusing rabbit trail that doesn't really get us anywhere. So I don't really think it help, it's helpful to try and rationalise all of that, but it, it won't really deal with the issue fundamentally. This is a very messy and confusing subject if we start going there. Lest we forget, there are certain types of people who are not to be forgiven, at least in some context or aspect. Those who blaspheme the Spirit, for instance, which is attributing Jesus' power of the Holy Spirit to Satan. The Church has the authority to eject members who sin against others and do not repent of it, treating them as a heathen. This instruction is given right before the parable of the unforgiving servant. So for the sake of putting your mind at rest, Let's just consider that maybe there could be some salvific connotations to what Jesus is saying, that to some extent there may be an application that if we don't forgive others, maybe we won't be eternally forgiven. So just in case somebody out there is worried about this. The mistake that legalists make with a subject like this is to confuse something that may require ongoing or repetitive action, like forgiving other people's sins, with the one-time act of salvation. They therefore confuse this subject and turn forgiveness into some sort of bag of tokens, where you're constantly dispensing tokens to get the grace needed to forgive your own sins. The problem is then that this is, again, no longer grace. You have turned forgiveness into a currency exchange, leading back into debt. And if I ever meet a person that espouses salvation by grace without works, except for forgiving other people is the one thing that we do have to do otherwise, but it's not works, I'll let you know when that happens. It hasn't happened yet. 
Usually when people throw Matthew 6 at me in the comments, it's because they're trying to argue for work salvation, so even they think that it's works. Naturally, when you compare this constant giving of something throughout your life with the one-time deal of salvation, obviously it's a confusing and illogical comparison. So they have to invent doctrines like losing salvation and getting it back again, even though that contradicts so many scriptures, or retrospectively examining your past life as the Calvinists would do to form your own opinion about whether your faith really did produce all this fruit of forgiveness or not. But then legalists act as if this is the only possible or acceptable interpretation, as if there's no other possible way of interpreting this that we can even consider. I propose to you that it is possible to consider the salvific connotations of forgiving others in an eternal life way without turning it into an ongoing work, but simply tying it together with the one-time act of repentance unto salvation. But I have to share with you a little story to explain this. Some months ago, I did a video discussing somebody who once had a channel for a short while that was spreading free grace messages, and the channel name was Inked Unicorn Weirdo. Now, she reached out to me privately, and cordially we agreed that I would take that video down, which is why it's not published anymore. I did feature her appearance without her permission, and she had some personal stuff going on which wasn't her fault, so I did remove that video and delete it. But basically, what happened was, all of a sudden, this woman who had been preaching grace shut down her channel, created a second channel, and very quickly switched from preaching free grace ideas to suddenly spreading a lot of atheistic, gospel-hating, Christ-rejecting messages. And she suddenly decided that she didn't believe any of this anymore. And she ended up hating the gospel. And I guess maybe you could say that when she was preaching grace, perhaps she really did it out of ignorance because she maybe had a misunderstanding of who Jesus really is. And one of the things that I remember her saying was that the only reason she became a Christian in the first place was because she wanted to see some of her enemies judged in hell, basically. But then she still wanted the mercy of God for her own sins to be forgiven. So there are people out there who seem quite happy to see other people go to hell and not be forgiven, and they want that for their enemies. But then they want to monopolise God's mercy and grace for themselves, or for people that they approve of. Well, if that speaks to you... If you're the kind of person that you would like to see some people not forgiven and go to hell, I guess all I can really say to that is that imagine if God had that attitude on you. Imagine if God wanted you to be unforgiven and to go to hell and to see you judged. And so I think that anecdote is quite a good illustration of Jesus' words in an eternal life context. If Christianity or the gospel only appeals to you because you want to see your enemies judged and thrown in hell but you want to see yourself let off the hook for your own faults, this gospel and this religion is probably not for you. You're probably looking in the wrong place. And so that could be an example of somebody who did not forgive in an eternal life context and wasn't forgiven eternally. But it had nothing to do with an ongoing thing of, well, I forgive him for this thing and I remember to forgive him for that thing. It's not like that. It's just the position of somebody who is stiff-necked and has a hard heart. If you're just sitting there worrying about every possible tiny microaggression that's ever been committed against you in your entire life, or you worry that every single day that you maybe had a slightly unforgiving demeanour that day, okay, you're looking at this all the wrong way, and you're overlooking the part of the sermon that told you not to worry, and that your Heavenly Father knows to give you good even though you are evil. Instead, you should think within yourself, just as the position of your heart, do I want God's mercy on all of my sins to save me when I was an enemy of God? Well, by that same token, then, should I not also want God's mercy and grace for other people, including my own enemies? Or am I trying to hog all of God's grace all to myself and not share it with others just because I've got personal grudges when I do things wrong as well? That's an entirely different and perfectly plausible allegorical application of forgiving others to be forgiven in a salvific context without turning it into legalism or maintenance. So I'm sorry that this has maybe ended up being quite a long explanation. I anticipated that this video would have been smaller, but I did have to branch off to explain this properly. So I hope that this has helped, and I hope that I haven't confused people even more with this. This is no-nonsense Christianity reminding you that it's by grace through faith that you're saved and not of yourselves.